Aloha and welcome to this video presentation that uh, I'm using as the kickoff to the Milestone 2 development phase for the software side of the Solar Decathlon project. And I'm going to start this presentation with a fairly quick overview of the Milestone 2 goals and actually the goals of the entire software side of the system that's suitable for all audiences, uh, marketing, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and so forth. And I, th I hope that most of you will take the time to look at this first part of the video because um, it's uh, important for the software side to be in alignment with everybody else on the project. And uh, so I'm trying to help communicate our goals to everybody else so that we can make sure we're all on the same page. So essentially, what's the mission of the software side of the project? And, and my belief is that the goal is to provide a student-based, innovative software solution. So one of the key things we want to do when we go to Washington is to create and demonstrate functionality that's not available in existing commercial off-the-shelf solutions. I don't think that's that hard to do, actually, but we need to actually explicitly make it happen. Um, and that's part of what we're doing in the design of this software system, is exploring what would actually be required in order to make that possible. I think the easiest way to get there is essentially to think about what it would mean for the house to be smart. So what makes a house smart? Um, first, it, it would require data, right? So we need to know something about the current state and probably the historical state of the major house systems, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute. Once we have that data, then we have to, you know, kind of uh, do some kind of computation on that data. It can be simple or complicated. And uh, in order for the house to be smart, we have to have some kind of resulting control. So um, we can collect all the data that we want, but if we can't act on it, then the, the intelligence of the house is severely limited. Finally, and, and I think this is the key thing, the Solar Decathlon house being developed by Team Hawaii has a lot of unique innovative features, okay, like aquaponics system, for example, and the lighting system. And so in order to make a software system that is, uh, that demonstrates capabilities not available in any commercial off-the-shelf solution, what we need to do is, is provide integration. So in other words, if we can affect the state of lighting based upon the state of aquaponics, that would be something that would be very difficult for a commercial off-the-shelf solution to do because not many commercial off-the-shelf solutions you know, support aquaponics, for example, and the particular kind of aquaponics that we're implementing. So I think that's, that's low-hanging fruit for creating software that's going to do something interesting that will wow the, the, the folks that come to look at it. The second thing that we can do is we can integrate with, um, with systems outside the house itself. So we can think about Facebook or smartphones or tablets, Connect, and, and so forth. And so those two forms of integration, I think, are key to uh, creating a solution that's feasible within the time period that we have and also demonstrates something pretty, pretty nifty. Just to quickly, those of you who haven't seen this before, this is our architectural diagram. On the left, we have house systems. They're going to communicate via HTTP with our iHolly system. Um, the simplest solution is to have a wireless um, connection between the house systems and iHolly um, and uh, send data and commands back and forth via the HTTP protocol. On the other side, we can have a variety of different systems um, that, that also communicate with iHolly and through iHolly with the rest of the house systems. Um, tablets, smartphones, Facebook, um, you know, the Connect whole body controller, <coughs> and, and so forth. Here's a current example of the user interface just so that you can see that we have been, we have actually built and delivered um, a preliminary versions of the software that have some simple functionality. So this is not just vaporware. For Milestone 2, the, our goal is to implement um, one particular um, set of monitoring and control systems for all five house systems. Now, we can't do it on the real house, of course, and one of the advantages of, of doing software is that we can build a simulator which uh, can act as if the real house had all of these, uh, the monitoring and control systems that, that we're selecting. 
And that enables us to kind of see what, um, you know, what capabilities we could, we could implement given that set of particular monitoring and control systems. So what I want to do now is go through with all of you the set of monitoring and control systems that are, have been selected for Milestone 2 um, so that you get a chance to see where we're heading and then we can have an ongoing conversation about um, you know, what, uh, what we really want for the house by October. For aquaponics, we've had some really fun conversations with the aquaponics team about uh, brainstorming ideas for things that we could monitor and control, and we came up with this kind of laundry list of things, everything from you know, simple stuff like pH and oxygen to actually detecting the number of dead fish in the tank. Um, I'm not exactly sure how they're going to do that, but it would be cool. Um, on the control side, there's lots of things we can do from, from simple things like, you know, setting the temperature to more complicated things like harvesting the fish <coughs> via, I guess, some kind of net that sweeps across the top of the, or sweeps across the tank. Um, so those are the things we're designing for Milestone 2, and, you know, hopefully some subset of them will make it into the, the real system or maybe even more things. For the HVAC system, we currently have relatively simple monitoring and control, just um, setting the temperature and, and monitoring what the temperature is. I believe that the HVAC people have suggested other things, like the amount of, I guess, essentially stored energy in the, in the, the holding tanks or something, but um, that's something that we want to work more with the HVAC folks to, to understand better for, um, for Milestone 3. Photovoltaic, that one's pretty simple. Um, we'll use an e-gauge meter, which will give us the ability to monitor power and energy. Um, there's no real control necessary for that. For electrical consumption in the house, we're currently designing for Milestone 2 under the assumption that there's a single meter which is going to give us consumption for the entire house, and so we can't get appliance level consumption. That's something that I'm hoping for a later milestone that we can change, so we can get consumption on an appliance basis um, via maybe uh, you know wireless um, plug load monitors, which um, I know of a company in town that that uh, may be interested in working with us on that on that solution. For lighting, we're assuming that we can control and monitor the level, the color, and whether or not the lights are on or off for each uh, each room in the house, um, and. Uh, Again, this, um, this is a fairly basic kind of monitoring control scenario for lighting. So what I'd like everybody to think about is the, what would constitute a sweet spot for the, the monitoring and control capabilities, and thus for the software as a whole, that enables us to create some innovation. Um, there should be some aspect of our software, I really hope, that will go beyond the state of the art. Um, and key to that is, is getting the right set of monitoring and control capabilities to enable us to do that. Um, beyond having just one thing, I'd like to see as, as many possible opportunities for smart behavior as possible. Um, we've had discussions about applying machine learning algorithms so that um, the house can actually predict you know, what it should be doing with respect to its systems uh, you know, prior to the occupants having to manually set them. Again, that's possible if we have the appropriate kinds of, uh, of monitoring and control and, and not possible otherwise. And then finally, of course, there's budgetary constraints that we need to stay, stay within. So what I'd like to have everybody think about is, you know, what else can we monitor and control um, and what other kinds of smart behavior you'd like to see? I still think that it's appropriate to, to you know, to brainstorm at this point and um, to not prematurely commit to a solution while there's still opportunity to explore um, uh, things. I, I think that introducing monitoring and control, um, particularly if it's a wireless-based um, communication network, is, uh, you know, doesn't affect the structure of the house. So, um, you know, it's, it's something that I'm hoping that we can continue to, to explore and, and design around for, for the next several months at least. Okay, thanks for listening. Again, the student lead for this project is Kurt Teichman. Um, I'm Philip Johnson, the faculty sponsor. You feel free to contact either of us if you have questions or, or comments. Now I'm going to go on to the second part of this um, presentation, which talks about the software uh, specifics for Milestone 2. If you're um, not a hacker, then uh, you can stop now because this is going to get very boring very quickly for you. 
Okay, so in milestone one, this is just a review of the way the structure of the software was. We had the iHale API jar file, and that essentially defined two interfaces, one for the repository that was going to provide the persistent store for state data. The second was an interface for the commands that could be invoked by the, um, uh, the, um, the front end <coughs> Um, on back end, and the back end would, would implement those commands by sending out HTTP requests to the various systems. There was a third interface for listeners, which I forgot to supply here, but, um, but there's that as well. In milestone one, it was the responsibility of the back end to implement both of these interfaces. It was the responsibility of the front end to actually use this back end Im implementation, or both of them, in order to uh, you know, carry out its particular tasks. And the simulator was um, basically focusing on the HTTP API, and it didn't really need to deal with, with iHale API jar at all. Milestone 2 um, is, is going a, a somewhat different direction based upon your comments that, that we got. I found that the, 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 the interface that I designed for Milestone 1 was very flexible. I still kind of like that interface a lot, but, um, but the, the use of strings throughout as the, as the way to represent names for various commands and systems and so forth um, created a lot of hassle for you guys. And so when I designed Milestone 2, the interfaces, I decided to go a different direction, which would essentially eliminate all your string-based confusions. And as I got into that definition of the interface, I thought to myself, well, heck, I'm just going to go ahead and implement the actual repository part of the interface um, as well, because what the heck, I can do it quickly, and um, I want to make sure that you guys um, maintain forward mo momentum with respect to um, the, the remainder of the system. So in milestone two, iHale API.jar is going to provide both the interfaces for the repository and the interface for the commands, as well as the listener interfaces, and it's going to provide um, actually the implementation of the repository. So that means that for milestone two, the responsibility of the back end system is to implement the command interface um, and use the existing iHale repository implementation to store state data. The front end now will use um, the back end implementation of the command. Um, uh, interface in order to send off stuff to the, the house systems, but it can use the iHale API repository implementation that, that you have um, today. So the way this works is that we're going to, instead of using strings to specify system names, state variable names, command names, room names, and so forth, we use Java enumerated types, and that's going to mean that um, we have compile time um, you know, specification of, of essentially the legal strings. Also, instead of having just basically one generic store method, which takes, you know, all sorts of, uh, you know, generic parameters, um, or one, one retrieval method, I should say, I'm, uh, this API provides about 60 <laughs> methods that explicit, each one explicitly retrieves one particular system state variable combination. And for any particular system state variable combination, such as aquaponics pH, you know, aquaponics temperature, HVAC temperature, et cetera, for any of those combinations of systems and state variables, you get one method that will retrieve the most recent value of that state, and another method where you can supply a timestamp and it will return all of the state uh, you know, value combination pairs from the, the time of that timestamp up to the present, which is what you generally need in the front end for doing uh, charting. The third thing is that there's a new kind of persistent data, which is called a system status message. And that enables the user interface to have some kind of scrolling window you know, on the various pages that report what's going on in the system, and you, and you can scroll back and forth through this um, file. And that's persistent, so you can bring down the system and bring it back up, and you can see that window uh, you know, be refreshed with, with all of the historical data. So the benefits of this is that um, what was a, a you know, wiki page called the API dictionary is now hard-coded into the system. Um, you know, there's no strings, essentially no strings that you manipulate, um, and so there will be no problems with uppercase, lowercase, all that kind of stuff. The second nice benefit of this is that the front end 
as it's doing development, can now use the repository implementation right away, populate it with sample data right away, and uh, be able to create you know, a running front end with test data immediately. And I think that will speed up um, the, uh, you know, the front end development considerably. Of course, it can send commands, but the commands won't do anything um, because they, you know, until it has a back end that, that actually supports the commands. But um, I think this is going to really facilitate development, I hope. Plus, for the back end folks, of course, now you've got a lot less to do um, because you've already got a repository implementation. Okay, let's um, go on to the demo. And the way I want to do this, I want to give you a real quick overview of, of how things work. The first thing I'm going to do is show you the Java docs for the iHale API package. Um, feel free to download this uh, system. Actually, I'll, the very first thing I'll do is show you that um, in the download page of the Solar Decathlon project, I've eliminated all the old downloads and we're starting off fresh. And here are the three zip files for the iHale API a back-end example that uses it, and a front-end example that uses it. And then I'm going to real quick kind of go through um, some of the code in, in these packages and just, um, you know, kind of introduce you to how they work. So it's probably useful to download the, the iHale API, unzip the package, and run ant-f javadoc.build.xml to generate the javadocs um, because that it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff in here, <coughs> and the javadocs are really the best way to do it. First thing I want to show you is that I told you that um, that there's no strings left because we have these enumerated types, and so you might as well. I'd like to start by kind of um, taking you through these enumerated types. It's in a class called API Dictionary, and there's one enumerated type called iHale System, and you can see we define the five kinds of systems that are available here. <coughs> there's a uh, a another enumerated type called iHale state, and there's quite a few different state variables, okay? So this defines, you know, I don't know, there's, you know, 20, a couple dozen of these things. These define all of the particular kinds of uh, state that's possible to be collected in the system for milestone two. And what you can see, it documents the, um, you know, kind of what this state variable does or, or represents, like water circulation. And it also tells you the type of value that's going to be associated with this state object. Okay, so that's, that's kind of, you'll find at times that's uh, useful information for you to know because there will be methods that will return the, the value of a state variable as an object. And then you'll want to cast it to its actual kind of value. And so this documentation page um, shows you how that, that works. Okay, there's also um, uh, the command types. So here's an example. There, here are the set of commands that can be invoked on the various systems at this point in time. And um, here are the set of rooms. I, I, there's no bedroom. In, is there a bedroom in this house? I hope. Anyway, um, uh, you know, those are the four that we're, we're having for right now. Of course, they can, that can easily be fixed if we need more rooms or less rooms. Um, and then there's finally this, this um, enumerated type for system status messages. So the idea is that in the milestone two, we're going to support this kind of semi-logging type capability that will be persistently stored, where we can where we can store a, a message to be displayed in some kind of you know status window in the user interface. And then we can also, when we generate one of these status messages, which will typically be done in the back end, you can associate with that status message. A kind of a priority level. Anything from debug, which is stuff that you probably wouldn't see actually in the running system, to inf informational messages, to um, warning messages means that something's going wrong, to an alert message, which means, you know, danger, Will Robinson, there's, there's some big problem here. Okay, so you could color the alert messages red, the warning messages yellow, the info messages green, you know, something like that. Okay, um, so I think that takes us through the API dictionary pretty much. Um, then the other thing I want to show you is in the uh, repository class, we'll look at the iHale repository interface. Okay, so this is the database inter interface. And you can see that there are all sorts of methods. Okay, so here's, here they all are. You know, there's quite a few of them. I think there's, you know, over almost 60 of them. And yet what you can see is that there's a single method. If you wanted to get the pH, the most recent pH value that you know about for the aquaponic system, um, 
there's a method for that. Okay, get aquaponics p. Whoops, sorry. Get aquaponics pH. Okay, and what that method does when you call it is it's going to return the most recently collected data on pH, and it will return it <coughs> via this object called a timestamp double pair. And all that is is an object which which will return the value associated with whatever, you know, a, a, in this case, a double value, and the timestamp at which that value was collected. So in other words, if we want to know the most recent uh, pH value, we call this get aquaponics pH method. Whoops, that's not quite what I want to do. We call, and then we use this, um, the get value method of the object that's returned to actually get the, the actual double representing the, the most recent pH. Okay, and that's kind of the design approach that's, that's used throughout this API, is that if we want temperature, for example, of aquaponics, we return a timestamp integer pair, which combines together the timestamp at which this data was collected, along with an integer representing the temperature. So if you look through this, what you're going to see is there's some doubles, there's some integers, there's, in the case of gated lighting color, it's a timestamp string pair, and in the case of lighting, get lighting enabled, timestamp boolean pair. Okay, so there's about four. There's four different combinations of these timestamp, you know, object pair data structures. Um, and so that's you know almost all of these things are going to return those objects. Now the difference you'll see is that sometimes we return a single object such as timestamp integer pair for get, get HVAC temperature. Then there's a kind of a parallel method that where um, you can, um, so if we have times to get HVAC temperature, there's also a get HVAC temperature since, which accepts a timestamp. And what that will return is a list of timestamp integer pairs rather than a single timestamp integer pair. And that list is going to be all of the, the, the data that's been collected from the time of that timestamp up until the current time. So when I looked at the interface, it seems to me that all the charts that are generated you never want to see a chart for, you know, three weeks ago. You always want to see a chart that starts either an hour ago or a day ago or five days ago or a week ago or a month ago and then goes up till the present. So this API basically implements that design pattern, which is that for any kind of charting, we want a list of, of data, you know, kind of XY values. And it should always end with the most recent value that we have and it can go back some arbitrary time into the past. Okay, so that's the iHale um, repository interface. If we go into the implementation package, we see the implementation of that in this class called repository. The repository class is type safe or thread safe. Okay, and what that means is that you can create instances. You can create as many instances of this um, object of this class as you want. You can create it. You know, it's it's they're very cheap to create. There's no overhead. You know, there's almost zero overhead attached with creating new instances. You don't have to make a singleton. Um, so whenever you need a repository object at any time in your code, feel free to just say, you know, repository, repo equals new repository, okay? And, um, and you can make a new one. So what you'll see is that um, the repository implementation provides implementations for all of those get methods that were in the interface. And then it also is going to provide a set of store methods, which is how you get data into the interface, or sorry, get data into the database. Now the idea here is that the interface, okay, the interface methods, these get methods, are what is used by the front end. Because it basically, the front end just wants to retrieve information from the database. It shouldn't really be storing information into the database. On the other hand, the back end is actually the place where the storage of data is going to occur and um, so the implementation of this interface includes all of those methods plus some additional methods that provide for for storing things okay so the back end is going to basically make new instances of the repository class the front end is going to make new instances of the uh, shoots the uh, here it is the front end is going to make new instances of iHolly repository, okay? Or it'll say iHolly repository repository equals new repository because it has to make an, an, an instance of an actual concrete implementation. But um, the, the actual 
you know, variable will have the type iHolly repository so that the front end will only have access to the get methods. And I'll show you that right now, how that works. So if we go to the code, what I want to do is start with, uh, in the iHolly backend example, okay, if we go here, you can see that it consists of just one class. That's all I've implemented for the backend. That's all that's really necessary. And um, what you can see is this iHolly, sample iHolly backend. It's going to implement the iHolly command, um, which is the, the interface that's not implemented in iHolly API. Okay, so this is the interface that actually um, the backend has to implement. So I can I show you an example of doing it. But in order to do the stuff that the backend needs to do, it just can create an instance of this repository class, and it's got all of the persistent stuff that it needs right in there. The um, the iHolly command interface specifies a single method called do command, which takes a system, a room that's only looked at if system is the lighting system, the command that's supposed to be invoked by this do command, and then an object which specifies the value that's being uh, the, the command wants the house system to to change to. Okay, and so um, you always want to store, when the front end issues a command to the back end, the, one of the back end's responsibility is to store that that command occurred in the repository. Okay, so this first little piece of code shows how you do that. The second thing is that we probably want, every time the front end invokes a command, is to have a little message in our system status window saying, oh, you know, this command was invoked at this point in time. And this next little piece of code shows how to do that. And then finally, given that there's a command that needs to be executed, you have to actually go out and emit the HTTP code to do it. And so here's an example of how, because we have an enumerated type, we can do this simple kind of dispatching thing to say what's the kind of system that the, the user, the, the front end, wanted changed. And then we can write a separate method for each of the systems. Okay, and we can use this case statement to do it. And uh, you notice I didn't implement that, that stuff there. Um, but that's how you might do that, okay? So that's how the, the, the do command um, method would be implemented. It's, it's actually, you know, pretty straightforward. The second part of the backend system is to, um, to actually retrieve and store state that it's received from the, the house systems. And so I have this example state from house systems method, which is showing how, you know, the way you do that using the new API implementation. And it's pretty simple. So let's say that, you know, somehow we, we issued some HTTP and we found out that the current temperature of the house was 22. How do we want to store that in the back end or store that in the, um, in the repository? Well, we have to first specify the system um, that we want to store this state with, which would be HVAC. We have to determine the state variable, which turns out to be this one. Of course, we have to get our value for that state variable, which we're just saying is 22. And then we get a timestamp, okay? Once we have that, all we have to do is just create an, ex an instance of our repository and then call the store method, where we specify the system, the state variable, the timestamp, and the temperature, and we're all done, okay? Um, pretty, pretty easy. Okay, here's another example. This time we found out that uh, we have some dead fish in the tank, and so we basically do the same kind of thing here. In the case of, uh, in some cases, we get some state with it where, that we want to notify the, you know, the user about. It's a big deal, and so we could have a system status message that's of type alert saying, oh, fish are dying, you know, um, do something about it. And then we store call the store method with the type system status message, uh, system status message, and that gets stored in the repository. Okay, um, so that's how the back end would look using this new API. I think you'll see that it's hopefully going to be considerably simpler, considerably less error prone than the prior, prior approach. The cost is that it's much more restrictive. You're, you're restricted to a specific set of command types, specific set of state variables, specific set of methods, and if you want to do something that isn't in one of those methods or enumerated types, then you're out of luck. Um, but I think that's a good trade-off for right now. Okay, let me finish off by just showing you the, uh, the front end example. And that's pretty much uh, like before in that we have a main program and then we have a couple listeners uh, implemented or actually three listeners implemented for the, the various kinds of things that we might want to know about. But the main program is, is uh, more or less all the, the most important part. 
we create a repository instance for the, the front end, but instead of saying it's of type repository, we're going to say it's of type iHolly repository. That way, the front end is only going to use the methods in that interface. Okay. Um, we add, just like before, the front end is going to add system state listeners. They have a slightly different structure than previously, um, but we'll you know, call it basically the same way. And then we can also add a listener for these system status messages. So whenever the back end stores a new system status message, we can retrieve that. We can find out about that using a listener. And there's also a method that you can use to re retrieve the, all of the system status messages from the last day or whatever, so that when you start up the user interface, you can populate it with all the system status messages that are of interest. Now, of course, the front end not only needs an implementation of the repository, it also needs an implementation of the back end, so we create that here. And we're going to um, run that method from the back end that, that pop puts a couple state variables in and, and uh, and that will trigger the, the listeners. Um, and so what you can see is, uh, well, I'll show you the actual running of that in a second. And, it's, and it, just as before, in addition to using listeners, you can actually invoke repository methods directly in order to get information to populate the user interface from. Um, so here's an example of getting the most recent value for dead fish and then printing it out. Um, Here's an example of getting the, the history of the dead fish, all the dead fish for the last day, um, and printing that out. And then the final thing is invoking a command. So let's say we want to change the temperature of the house to 28 degrees. Here's how we do that. Okay. So just to show you that it works, what we'll do is go to the uh, front end and say ant run. And so you can see that invokes the main program, and we'll get that stuff printed out. So that's something you can play with to to more easily understand the system. OK, I think that's all that I want to talk about. Oh, um, maybe before I stop, let me just quickly go through the structure of the system state listener. OK, so you're going to call it kind of before, instead of passing a string with the name of the system that this listens for, you're going to pass it the enumerated type. And then for when you get in, when this listener is invoked for a particular system, you have to figure out what's the type of uh, state variable um, because you probably want to do different things depending on what state variable was actually changed. And then here's some code that shows you know, how you might do that. Okay? It's up to you to look in the API dictionary class to see that's where the documentation of what state variables uh, are for each of the systems. Okay? So that's not hard coded into the, this design at all. That's something you have to just you have to look. And it, as you can see, that I have a default clause with all these switch statements that if, if you know, none of these handle the, the, um, if the state variable was not one of these, then we need to do something to indicate to the user that, um, that there's a problem. Okay? Um, there's aquaponics listener, there's an HVAC listener, which looks just like that. Then there's the system status listener, which is a little simpler. It has a, it has a you know, you implement a different type of interface for this because the method is called message added, and what it's going to get is a system, the message type, and a string that's the actual message. So the structure of this one's a little different from state messages because it's status messages. Okay, that's it. Um, have fun with this interface. I think you're going to find it once you get used to it uh, to be a, a lot less hassle to use than what you were doing before. Um, it's more restrictive, so that you know will maybe be painful in some ways. But I think on balance, it's going to get you to milestone two um, pretty easily, and then we'll move on to milestone three from there.